Coming up on Pet Heroes, we look back to World War II and the Battle of Hong Kong, where the actions of one dog saved the lives of seven soldiers. And a group of Canadian soldiers stationed in Afghanistan go beyond the call of duty to rescue a starving puppy. I'm Jason McCoy, and welcome to Pet Heroes. The use of animals in military conflict spans throughout our history. But how was that bond between humans and animals tested during these difficult times? Today, we look at soldiers past and present and the animals that had an impact on them. Robin Walker lives in St. Thomas, Ontario, and is the author of Sergeant Gander, a Canadian hero. The story of Gander came to me as a result of another writing project that I was doing for a magazine. And as a result of the research for that article, Gander was a hero. He needed recognition, and the fact that he hadn't received recognition, I think, was a mistake that needed to be rectified. Gander was originally named Pal, and his story begins around 1940. The Royal Rifles, a Canadian Army regiment, sets up station at Gander Airport in the Dominion of Newfoundland. The airport is quickly renamed Royal Canadian Air Force Station Gander and is soon a hub of activity, sending new pilots and aircraft to the war effort abroad. He was born uh, probably sometime in 1939. He was uh, a pup, family pet. And the important thing to remember all through this is he was never a service dog. He was always a pet, no matter who he belonged to. The pilots at the busy RCAF station Gander don't encounter many obstacles on this side of the Atlantic, but they do keep a constant eye out for the bear who enjoys napping on the runways. More than once, they, they did have pilots radio in that couldn't land bear on the runway, uh, please advise. So uh, he was a character. The friendly dog is a favorite with the children, but after accidentally scratching a young girl, the Haydens decide that Pal is too big to be a family pet. They offer the big Newfoundland to the men of the Royal Rifles stationed at RCAF Gander, who graciously accept and rename him Gander. Jeremy Swanson, a former commemorations officer with the Military Museum in Ottawa, worked closely with the veterans of the Second World War. The regiment inherited the dog Pell and called it Gander, and that was where it all came from. So he became part of the, uh, of the regiment. The men absolutely loved him. He even had a number. He was on the strength, so to speak. He even had rations. They called it a military mascot. They did give him an honorary title of sergeant, so he was known as Sergeant Gander, and he had stripes that went on his harness to prove his rank. Oh, I better look at this sergeant. He was assigned a kit bag with his bowl and his brush, and he was assigned a handler as well, uh, who was responsible for the day-to-day the -day care of the dog. His handler was, uh, at that point, a young man by the name of Fred Kelly. He and the dog were in inseparable. He used to jump into the shower with them, he used to drink beer, and uh, used to travel with them everywhere, and he became the mascot. They built him a doghouse outside, and he put up such a fuss, howling and carrying on, that the soldiers just said, forget it. Fred Kelly brought him inside the barracks, and he slept right next to Fred during the night. In the fall of 1941, British forces stretched beyond their capabilities in defense of their homeland request assistance from Canada. In October of 1941, the Royal Rifles and the Winnipeg Grenadiers are sent to Hong Kong to strengthen the garrison against an attack by the Japanese. Uh, the men were adamant that they weren't going to leave Gander behind. So when they got their orders to ship out, there was literally no discussion. The dog is coming with us. The Royal Rifles journey across the country by train. Arriving in Vancouver, the regiment attempts to lead Gander on board the Prince Robert, the ship that will take them across the Pacific to Hong Kong. But the captain quickly turns the bear away. And they put up quite a fuss, convinced the captain that this was just not a bear, just a very large dog. Gander was allowed to board, and uh, he made the journey across the Pacific to Hong Kong with the Canadian soldiers. The Royal Rifles, with their mascot Gander in tow, land in the British colony of Hong Kong, 
on November 16, 1941. They had very little training, but they were all completely fitted out and they helped the Hong Kong garrison's morale tremendously because they saw these young fit men turning up with their dog in the front. I think um, that uh, they drew a connection to home, to things from home. I think they recognized in him their own pets, perhaps, and they recognized somebody who was loyal and devoted and dedicated to them. And uh, there, was a, there was definitely a connection between the dog and the men as to normality. Kelly McMillan is a clinical counselor who works closely alongside military personnel to assist soldiers who have experienced trauma. A dog particularly is an instant source of calm and soothing and nurturing. A lot of people who've been deployed get into a constant state of hyperarousal, so they're constantly on alert, and they don't know how to come down again. And the pet, by holding the pet and putting your hand on its um, chest and just monitoring its breathing and trying to mirror your breathing with the pet is a way of teaching people how to start calming down. And so it's really effective in teaching people um, how to not only monitor their emotions, but to get control back of their emotions. The young men enjoy three weeks of quiet patrols. Then on December 8th, all hell breaks loose. With a massive surge, Japan sends troops across into the territories of the mainland. Indian and British troops are pushed back rapidly, and within days, their backs are against the sea of the Kowloon mainland coast. By December 13th, all of the mainland troops have pulled back to Hong Kong Island itself. Now, Gander was already on the island. He was with C Company of the Royal Rifles. The uh, Royal Rifles were charged with protecting a certain section of the, uh, of the island called the Lai Moon Gap, which is one of the smallest gaps between the island and the mainland. I mean, there were literally thousands and thousands of Japanese crossing that channel of water. And C Company, where Gander was, was located, um, you know, felt the full brunt of that invasion force. Well, Gander immediately, uh, he understood at this point that um, uh, the Japanese were the enemy. Outnumbered and outgunned, the brave men of the Royal Rifle Sea Company are quickly losing ground on the last piece of land they have to defend. After the break, the Royal Rifles continue losing ground until one of them is forced to make the ultimate sacrifice. Braving the invasion of the island of Hong Kong by the Japanese ground forces, the Canadian Army's Royal Rifles struggle to hold their tenuous position at Lai Moon Gap, a 400-meter water channel that separated the island from the mainland. And it was a hellish several days because the bombardment almost never stopped. At that point, the overwhelming numerical superiority of the Japanese is, is coming into play. And the Canadians are being forced back off the beaches and they're pulling back into the hills of Hong Kong. And C Company, where Gander was, was located, felt the full brunt of that invasion force. Reports tell of Gander rushing the Japanese and biting their ankles, and, and uh, even a story of two Japanese soldiers with bayonets running away from the dog with Gander after them biting, snapping at their heels. Eyewitness accounts recall being shocked that the Japanese didn't simply shoot him. Um, but he was large, he's big, he's rearing up on his hind feet, he's got a big set of teeth. It was probably a very frightening sight. I have no doubt that the guys had not just an intense bond, but a really incomparable respect for Gander because, again, he was a hero. I mean, he fought on his own and went where the guys were unable to go or unwilling to go. Gander continues to attack Japanese troops when they venture too close to his wounded comrades. The Royal Rifles recall the enemy running away from Gander, shouting, Black Devil in Japanese. Later, during interrogation in prisoner of war camps, the Japanese would ask the Canadians about the Black Devil. The enemy thought the Canadians had trained the Black Beast to fight in battle. Wendy McClellan, a doctor of veterinary medicine, offers her unique perspective on animal behavior. Newfoundland dogs are known for their acts of heroism, they're physically strong, they have a really sweet nature, and they have quite a lot of guardian instincts. When Gander recognized the threat, he went into protection mode. 
He positioned himself between the Japanese and the soldiers he was bonded to. This situation can be compared to a pack in that the whole pack protects each other. It's very much a situation of you watch my back, I'll watch yours. The battle rages on, but C Company of the Royal Rifles continue to be pushed back from Limoon Gap by the invading Japanese forces. And it was very typical for the Japanese to lob grenades up into the mountains, up into the hills. And the Canadians, if they were fast enough, would run out, grab a grenade, throw it back down at the Japanese. So this sort of game of catch was going back and forth. Gander and C Company of the Royal Rifles continue to counterattack the Japanese forces throughout the night of December 18th. As day breaks, Gander and a group of wounded Canadian soldiers recover and regroup following a failed attempt to retake a fortification on high ground the night before. Suddenly, a grenade lands in front of the wounded men. They can't get away. They're looking at this thing and, you know, a grenade. Uh, and the soldiers know they can do nothing to get away from it. What they saw out of nowhere came a black blur, which was Gander. He came charging out, gathered the grenade in his mouth, and took off with it. Sergeant Gander was killed in action that day, saving the lives of seven Canadian soldiers. And I think Gander absolutely acted to protect people that, that he felt he had an obligation to protect. The Canadians fought valiantly alongside British and Indian troops until their surrender to the Japanese on Christmas Day, 1941. They would spend the next three and a half years in prisoner of war camps. But the sacrifice they made will never be forgotten, and neither will Sergeant Gander. And they told me the story, and they said they'd always wanted the dog to get recognition for this selfless act. So that was the trigger for me. After first hearing the story, Jeremy and his staff at the War Museum worked tirelessly to ensure Sergeant Gander gets the recognition he deserves. He submitted Gander's name for the Dickin Medal, which is the animal equivalent to the Victoria Medal, and it's put out by a British veterinary charity. They hadn't received an application for the Dickin Medal in over 50 years, so they were absolutely shocked to get Jeremy's application. But after looking it over, they, they said, absolutely, this dog is deserving of our medal. There are children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, who wouldn't be here today had those men not been saved. So um, I don't think there's any denying that Gander's a hero. He gave his life for people who loved him and for people he loved. Next, Canadian soldiers posted in Afghanistan rescue a stray puppy as he in turn becomes one mother's symbol of hope. just saw how one dog was willing to sacrifice himself to save the lives of seven soldiers. Now we look at a group of soldiers stationed in Afghanistan who go to incredible lengths to save the life of a stray puppy. Robin Roy Hampton lives on a farm in southern Saskatchewan with her husband and their three dogs. Living in rural Saskatchewan, uh, it's, it's a farm life, it's, uh, it's a very quiet life. Small town, very friendly town, great place. Robin's dogs have spent their whole lives on the farm, but Guts is another story, and he came a long way to be here. Guts belongs to Robin's son, a private in the Canadian military whose section had found Guts while stationed in southern Afghanistan. My son met Guts when he got back to Afghanistan after being home for his Christmas leave. As the soldiers eat breakfast, a small puppy wanders in, desperate to find something to eat. They started feeding him bacon and he ate so much that he actually bloated. That's how he got the name Guts. 
oh, they connected right away. They had made a little bed for him, but he would go and whimper at somebody's cot till someone put him up on theirs. A dog can enter a camp and suddenly everyone's attention is attracted to the dog and for a moment the stresses of war sort of disappear and a dog speaks a common language so everyone can accept a dog regardless whether it comes from the enemy or not and a dog can provide um, grounding um, to a soldier it can sort of allow them for a moment to experience a break from war uh, a dog is also very soothing. When the guys are deployed, they're in a constant state of fight or flight, typically. So their blood pressure's up, their heart rate's up, and their breathing is faster. And a dog comes along, and all of a sudden, your blood pressure goes down, your breathing goes down, and your heart rate slows, and you experience that place of calm that you don't normally get to experience while you're in a war zone. During times of stress, animals can be so important. They provide a non-judgmental presence, constant companionship, and physiologically, even by just petting them, it reduces cortisol and blood pressure, having a real calming effect on the soldiers. As they begin their journey to Kandahar City, the soldiers must decide what to do with Guts. They know if they leave him behind, he won't survive. The next group that was coming in would have had to do away with him. So they decided they would throw in their backpack and away they went. They knew that their, their tour was going to be up in a couple of months. And if they wanted to get him home, they were going to have to, to get things rolling. And at that time, they were in Kandahar City. And they weren't supposed to have dogs there. And there were a lot of diseases, too, with dogs. The survival rate is very low. Taking you home. Albert Wong is a retired lieutenant commander with the Canadian Armed Forces living in Mississauga. Albert's own dog, Wutan, was rescued from Afghanistan, an event that prompted him to volunteer with Nowzad Dogs, an organization dedicated to helping soldiers get their pets out of war zones. We've had about eight dogs come back now, and one cat. It is an underground railway of pets. <laughs> I feel like... Uh, uh, one of those, you know, you, I show up at the airport and they say, I'm receiving a dog. <laughs> Their lives are literally in the balance. You know, if we did not do the paperwork right or if we had a misconnection somewhere, imagine they're stuck in, in Islamabad in, the, in an airport holding area in that heat and humidity. So their lives are in the balance. The process of hiding guts becomes more and more difficult every day as the soldiers' families work with Albert and now Zad dogs to raise the money to bring Guts home. I need you down at watering hole. Five. My son and the other soldiers were willing to pay it all themselves, um, but they thought, well, any help they can get. And it was amazing. People from all over the world that sent in funds for him. It was great. The guys would take a risk to keep the, the animal with them because of the rewards the animal brings to them uh, in terms of comfort, security, but also it's a bit of fun. So there's a bit of, these guys like a challenge and it's a challenge trying to hide the pup or to try to figure out ways to outsmart uh, superiors to make sure that they keep the puppy, you know, hidden away if necessary. It becomes fun and it becomes another team activity. And uh, it's kind of neat to see the guys rally together to strategize how to, you know, make sure that the animal stays part of their, their team. Having finally raised enough money to bring Guts home, the soldiers decide it's time for the young puppy to begin his long journey. They entrust him to a local taxi driver, who will then transport him to Kandahar Airfield, where he'll be checked out by a veterinarian before being put on a flight to Kabul, just one of many stops to come. We booked him on a flight from Kabul to Islamabad. Someone else met him, uh, took him into a shelter in Islamabad, and again, the veterinarian had to look through it and, and, and look him over, uh, make sure he validated all his vaccinations and created a new set of documents that the Pakistani airport authorities would recognize. Once we had all that done, uh, we then booked him on a flight, and there's a direct flight from Islamabad to Toronto. And then we called mum 
and said, we have your puppy, your son's puppy. Robin flies in from Regina, eager to meet up with Guts and escort him on the last leg of his journey home. I had a distinct feeling that for her, it was like her son, a part of her son uh, experience had come back to her. It was very emotional. My son was still in Afghanistan and still had a, a little over a month to go. But it was like having just a little bit of him back again. It was very emotional. After a long and harrowing trip, Guts finally arrives in Saskatchewan, where he waits to be reunited with the soldiers as they finish their tour of duty in Afghanistan. Seeing Guts return home, that's you know gonna be a really important connection for the soldier when he comes home to the memories of war, both positive and negative, and really it represents a success of his mission. No matter how bad things were, Guts is something positive that came out of that deployment and something he'll have for many, many years to come, and that's something really special. I think, uh, of course, the, the soldiers were heroes just to to take the time and the effort to get Guts home. Uh, and, and Guts was a hero for them, just by, just by being himself. Give them something else to think about. The bond established between humans and animals during wartime is a sacred and beautiful thing. Thanks to the heroic efforts of the soldiers stationed in Afghanistan, Guts no longer has to beg for his meals. And Sergeant Gander will always be remembered for the heroic efforts that saved the lives of seven soldiers during the Battle of Hong Kong. <laughs>